Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to you this morning. Um, welcome to Grace Baptist Church in Perth. Uh, thank you for joining with us this Lord's Day morning. Uh, we do pray and we hope this is actually our penultimate service like this, our penultimate broadcast like this. We do hope and intend on the 16th of August to meet physically once more, like many churches are doing just now. We're a few weeks behind, but we do hope and intend and pray that we will be able to meet physically at the Glen Eagles Daycare Centre in the Glen Eagles Road in Perth. As I said, on the 16th of August, that's our intentions. It would be great if you were able, if you were free and you were able to come along. It would be great to worship with you uh, rather like this than this, actually physically. Uh, we'd be in the same room and, and worshipping our wonderful and awesome God. Um, <clears throat> if you're not able to come, we're still hopefully going to be doing our recordings of the services morning and evening. We're not too sure what form this will take, uh, but we hope to be able to record and uh, put them on uh, our Facebook page and also our YouTube page. So keep an eye out for those as well if you're not able to physically meet with us or even go to your own church. We have a few announcements and they're, they're familiar announcements, I'm sure, if you've been listening over the last number of weeks. Tuesday evening at seven o'clock, we have our Christianity Explored course continuing. I think we're up to the seventh one uh, this Tuesday coming. And that's Christianity Explored at seven o'clock over the platform of Zoom. The next evening on Wednesday, again at seven o'clock and again on Zoom, the ladies are having their virtual cafe and, and they'll be continuing studying biblical womanhood as well as having a chat and a cup of coffee, no doubt. The next evening, Thursday, at half past six, half past six over Zoom, we have our Bible study and prayer meeting. And uh, this Thursday, we'll be continuing on in our series on fasting and the believer. Now, again, as I said, this is over Zoom, but we, we hope and we pray that we will be able to do, meet physically for the prayer meeting and Bible study. And we hope to do that on the 20th of August, the week after we open as a church uh, physically. So uh, keep um, your eyes and your ears peeled for more information on that. Um, all these announcements obviously are in the will of the Lord. Um, as <clears throat> if you've been a regular with us, you know on a Sunday morning we read the Psalms together as a congregation. And we're up to Psalm number 19 this morning. Psalm number 19. It's not as long as last week's. I think last week's was yep, 50 verses. Uh, this week is somewhat sh shorter. So Psalm number 19. If you have your Bibles, if you can open to the book of Psalms in chapter 19, and we'll read together the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and dripping of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors, declares me innocent from the hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. We know the Lord will add his blessing 
to the public reading of his word. Let us just pray at this moment. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for another day. We thank you for the breath that you give us this morning. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we are finding our place this morning to praise and to worship you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that it is your day that you have set aside for us to come and to worship you. Lord, we thank you that we can say with the psalmist that you are our rock, you are our redeemer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for that. And Lord, as we come this morning, as we come to praise you, we ask that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart are acceptable in your sight this morning. So often, Lord, we, we come to worship you in prayer and praise, and, and so often we fail so miserably because, Lord, you give us so much, you bless us so much each and every day. Even since last week when we met last, Lord, you have blessed us as a family, you've blessed us as a church, and we thank you for that, Lord. So, Lord, as we come to worship you this morning, may that be done in a true and a right way, in spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, as we as we come to what seems to be the the end game, as it were, the the end of this pandemic where things are starting to ease down. Heavenly Father, we just, we thank you for that. We thank you that we can see light at the end of the tunnel, that we will soon be able to meet together as a congregation physically in a, in a place of worship. And we thank you for that, Lord. We are aware that the church is not a building. Oh, Heavenly Father, we know that. But yet it's still good to meet together to see our brothers and sisters physically, to see them, look at them eye to eye and to be able to worship together in a place that we would call church. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray for the churches that are meeting. Even this morning, we pray for Cowden Beath. Lord, we would, we would pray for them, that you would undertake for them. We pray for Laurie as he comes to preach at Cowden Beath this morning. Be with him. And pray for all the other churches, Lord, that are meeting again. We pray for all the churches up and down this land. And we thank you for the witness that they have had over this pandemic and over this lockdown. And Lord, we just pray that that will continue, continue even more. And Heavenly Father, that you will use these churches to spread your word, to spread the gospel of Christ and to further your kingdom. And Lord, as we think of on ourselves, Lord, we would just pray for this morning that you would help us. Once more, Lord, every week we ask for the Spirit of God to be in the midst of us. And Heavenly Father, we know how important that is. And you say in your word, and we don't want to take it out of context, Lord, but you say in your word where two or three are gathered, there you will be. You will be in the midst. And Lord, we pray for that this morning. That wherever we are, if it's in our living room, if it's in our kitchen, if it's in a study, if it's in a conservatory, Heavenly Father, that you will be there with everybody who is listening. That, Lord, you will bless them. You will edify them and build them up this morning with your word. And, Heavenly Father, I ask for help for myself. Be with me this morning and help me. And we ask these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible with you, if you can turn with me once more to the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. Uh, we started to look at the book of Joshua last week and we'll continue on this week. And continue on in chapter one and I know many of you like to have a, a title for the sermons and um, if I was to give this particular sermon a title it would be how to live a prosperous Christian life how to live a prosperous Christian life and hopefully we'll see that in the first nine verses of uh, Joshua chapter one so as I said if you can turn to Joshua chapter one and we'll read from verse one. This is the word of the Lord. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I have given to you. Just as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, 
as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you, nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your ways prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen and amen. We'll end our reading there at verse number nine. So last week we saw the, the hand over power, of power as it were. The baton of leadership was, was passed from Moses to Joshua. Now Benjamin Franklin says when he's talking about the qualities a leader should have is quoted as saying, he that cannot obey cannot command. I'll repeat that. He that cannot obey cannot command. And I think we can safely say that we saw that characteristic in Joshua last week. He obeyed Moses. He obeyed God. And then he commands the nation into battles and to victory. And he's about to lead them in to the promised land. Joshua had been a slave. He had been a soldier. He had been a servant. And now he was about to become the leader of the nation. But this isn't about Joshua. This book isn't about Joshua. It, it has his name as the title, yes, but it's not really about him. It's not even about the great man, the man of God that he's taking over from. It's not about Moses either. This is about God. Now, I understand that all scripture uh, is about God. It points to God. But here we see a promise keeping God. And in the verses that we read this morning, even those nine verses, we see it's all about God. It's all about Yahweh. Look at what God says. He says, I am giving to them. I have given you. I promised. I was with Moses. I will be with you. I swore. Have I not commanded? This is all about God and him fulfilling the promises, the promises that he gave to Abraham many years ago, many hundreds of years before, where he said to Abraham, you will be the father of a multitude of nations. You would be fruit. He will be fruitful. God says to Abraham that he would give the offspring, his offspring, the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And that he, Yahweh, would be their God. So as we come to this point of scripture, God says to Joshua, take up the mantle of Moses. Stand in the gap as it were, but, but take up the mantle of Moses. And God tells Joshua here that he is chosen to take over. He, he hasn't been chosen by the people. There hasn't been a ballot. There's been no canvassing by the people for their favourite candidate. It was God. It was God's will that he would lead. God had chosen Joshua, the God of all creation, the awesome and mighty God. He is the one who chose Joshua. But there's more. God just doesn't leave it there. He just doesn't say, Joshua, I've chosen you. Now go and do it. No, he tells Joshua. In fact, he, he makes it very plain to Joshua here what he must do to succeed in the task that he's been given. And that's something that we can learn from Joshua, even in the 21st century. We can learn from the book of Joshua and from Joshua himself how to succeed in the Christian life. How to have a life that is glorifying to God. Which in the day that we live, 
it could be argued that that is more important than ever before. To live a life that glorifies God, a live a life that exalts God, a live a life that puts God first in everything that we do. And God tells Joshua here, do these things, Joshua, the things that I am commanding you to do, and you will have a prosperous life. Excuse me. <clears throat> but when scripture says a prosperous life or a life of prosperity, it, it doesn't mean the kind that we see on re religious television today. It's not that kind. The one that says, give us your money. And if you do that, you'll get something in return. Maybe more money or maybe a new car or maybe your mortgage will be paid off or that ailment you have or that cancer that you had will be cured. Just give us your money. But if that doesn't happen, well, that's not our fault. That's your fault because you haven't had the faith to follow that through. Now, of course, they're not they don't put it as coarsely as that, but they do tell the gullible things like it's the year of Jubilee. So give us four hundred and forty nine pound. And if you do that, then you will prosper beyond your wildest dreams. Let me tell you, that's a lie from the pit of hell. These men are not Christian. These men are crooks. They're thieves. They're robbers. All hidden behind a, a shiny smile and a shiny suit. But that's what they are. Thieves and robbers, crooks, they're not Christian. Now you may say to me at this point, Joe, you cannot judge those men. But I think I can. And hopefully we'll look at that this evening in Matthew chapter 7. But this isn't the kind of prosperity that we're talking about here. This isn't the kind of prosperity that God has promised Joshua. The kind of prosperity that only God can bring. The kind of prosperity that will bring glory to God. Not to man. Not to a preacher. Not to a denomination. But to God and God alone. And this is a kind of prosperity that will lead to a successful biblical Christian life. I'll repeat that. This is a kind of prosperity that will lead to a successful biblical Christian life. The kind of life that we should all be striving for. This is a kind of life that we should be living as a Christian today. And we see God give Joshua certain commands. First of all, he tells him to be strong and courageous. Then he tells Joshua to observe. Then he tells Joshua to meditate. And we'll look at the first of these just now. He says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you you go. God tells Joshua to be strong and courageous. He tells him three times in these nine verses. He tells him in verse 6, verse 7 and verse 9. And if I was Joshua here at this point, I think I'd be saying, well I am. H have you not seen me in battle? Surely you've seen me in battle, God. You've seen how courageous I am. You've seen how strong I am. How brave I am when I'm faced with your enemies or faced with my enemies. Joshua might have actually thought that this was one of his best qualities. His strength and his, his courage. Remember, he is a great soldier. He's led Israel into many battles and he's led them into many victories. And he says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. But he, he certainly is talking to Joshua directly. We see that, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 1. Verse 1 makes that plain. But I believe scripture also indicates that God is including the nation also. So when he says, be strong and courageous, he's talking to all. He's talking to Joshua and he's also talking to the people, the nation of Israel. That they all had to be ready to move forward, rise up and go over. It says that in verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan. Rise up and go over. This is what God has told them to do, all of them. Move forward into the battle. Move forward to possess the land. Move forward and that will glorify me. Move forward and you will be doing my will. You need to advance. They couldn't stay put at this point. They couldn't just keep camp there and build a city there. They had to move forward. 
They had to move forward if they wanted to do the will of God. And if you're a Christian, I believe Scripture is very clear in its teaching that it is impossible for you to stay still. If you do, if I do, if, if we stay still in our Christian life, if we do not grow and if we do not become more like Christ or if we don't or if we stay still in our Christian service, our service for the Lord, then really we're going in reverse. We're, we're, we're really we're going backwards. That's where we're going. That's the direction we're headed. We cannot stay still. If we do, we stagnate. If we do, we die. As a Christian this morning, we must be like Joshua and the people, the nation of Israel. We must be moving forward, moving ahead into the battle, a battle for the glory of God. That's what we must be doing this morning. Next, we see that Joshua and the people must observe. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Verse number seven again. Being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. They had to obey. They had to give heed to the scriptures that they had. This is what they must obey. They had to take heed to all the word, all the commands, not just what took their fancy on a particular day or on a particular evening. They had to perform all, all that God had told them to do, all that was written down in Scripture. Now, I hope I've emphasized that word, all, all the word, all the commands, perform all, all that was written down. You know, they're about to go over <clears throat> into the promised land and it's it's a wicked and it's a violent place full of fierce enemies remembers what remember what this the spies saw the 12 spies that were sent to, into Canaan by Moses they saw giants in the land that's what's about to present itself to them as they go in to possess the land but you know God's word will be their sword would be their weapon they would have had many weapons, physical weapons in their hand, maybe made of wood, maybe made of metal, made by skilled craftsmen. Weapons that maybe would just kill with one strike. They may have even had the odd wooden club as well. But these weapons would be weapons that any invading army would need to conquer. But more than this, the nation needed God's word. And God's word is more powerful than any weapon made by man. This is a weapon that they needed most. The nation of Israel and Joshua needed this weapon more than anything else. The sword of the word of the living God. With this, Satan would not stand a chance. The enemies in the, in the promised land would fall. And, and for us today... You know, we are in a spiritual battle. Sometimes we freaking get this, can't we? And that it is actually a daily battle. Satan attacks us each and every day. He tempts us with everything every day. And we can all testify to that, can't we? But the weapon that we have in our homes, in our hand, is greater than any nuclear bomb, any greater than any secret weapon that's been devised by China or Russia or America. We, we have a weapon that can defeat the enemies of God, can take down the strongholds of Satan. It has the power of life and death. That's what we have in our hands. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, For the word of God is, a, is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's, God's word is loved and it's hated. And one of the reasons it is hated is mankind, one reason, mankind wants to get rid of God's word because it shows the thoughts and intentions of his heart. 
That's why he wants to get rid of it. It exposes the wickedness of man. It exposes the wickedness of his heart. That's why they hate it. That's why they want to get rid of it. But that's why it's so powerful in the Christian's hand. Now we all know these verses. We know that verse off by heart literally. But do you believe with this verse? You know we have the words of eternal life. You know and as, as a Christian we need to get back to accepting without reservation, without qualification, the inspiration, the infallibility, the inerrancy, the authority, the sufficiency of the word of God. Then we see another command. Look at verse 8 with me. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Joshua here is commanded to fill his heart and his mind with the word of God. And at this point, that would be the law would probably be referring to the law found in the book of Deuteronomy, specifically to, to certain topics like idolatry or the way they were to worship or their dietary guidelines or dietary laws. But he was never to shop, stop sharing God's law and all that it teaches. He must always be teaching the people, teaching that, uh, that the obedience to God's word is important. And he has to explain it. He has to recite it. He has to deliver it to the people, not just to a select few. He has to, to tell and recite and, and teach all the people. This was to be on his mind day and night. So Joshua was to know God's word. The law of God was to be his guide. Listen, if that was the case, then Joshua had to be familiar with it, didn't he? He would need to read it. He would need to study it. And we need to do the same today. Not just read it, but study it and digest it deep into our souls. And surely when Joshua was alongside Moses, when he was his, uh, Moses' assistant, he must have been witness to, to Moses working on the writings. In the book of Exodus, actually, Moses is told by God to write down and recite in the ears of Joshua. So, so listen, Joshua knows God's word. I'm sure also that Joshua would have seen how important the word of God was to Moses. He may have seen him writing well into the night under the stars or maybe under the light of, a, of an oil lamp. And he himself, I'm sure, would have come to value them as Moses recited them to him. But also we see in this verse that he is commanded to meditate on the word. <clears throat> By doing this, it would shape his thoughts. It would focus his mind, not just on how the law could affect him, but also how it would affect all the people. Not just him, but everybody. So any decision that he made would be, it would be shaped by the word, not by the world. And as he meditated upon it, he'd be ready for God's will to be done. And this could only be done if Joshua meditated on the word, if it was a word, if it was to the forefront of his mind, day and night. And you know, when we meditate on scripture, when we have scripture to the fore of our lives, let me tell you, the same thing will happen for us. The decisions that we make will not be world-based, but word-based. I'll repeat that. The decisions that we will make because we have scripture to the fore of our minds will be, won't be world based, but they will be word based. The Lord will be, the, the will of the Lord will be so discernible for us and it won't be a mystery because we've meditated upon his word. But you know, we must meditate on the word. So many people today, the first thing 
uh, that they do and the last thing actually that they do and probably actually all the way through the day is check their phones. What notifications have I got? What are people saying? What is happening? Why haven't people liked my latest picture of a cat that I put up on Facebook? This is the first thing they do when they get up in the morning and the last thing they do. And throughout the day you see it. Checking. But let me tell you, that should be our Bibles. We should be picking them up first thing, reading them. Picking them up last thing, reading them. Reading them. Meditating on the word that we read. Lynn knows of a lady or knew of a lady. She's passed away now. But that lady had a Bible in every room of her home. Open in every room of her home. So an open Bible in the kitchen, an open Bible in the living room, an open Bible in the dining room. So no matter where she was in her house, wherever she was in her home, if she was sitting down, if she was preparing something to eat, if she was just about to fall asleep, she could read God's word. It was open and ready to be read. I, I think of that and I think, wow, wow. This this lady was in her, her 90s. In fact, I think she passed away when she was over 100. So she was still doing this. What an example. Listen, we have enough Bibles in our homes to do something like that. But you know, when we know the word of the Lord, when we meditate on that word, it helps us focus upon Christ. To remember all that Christ has done for us. How he has worked in our lives. The blessings that he has showered upon us. And when we remember these things, it helps us walk after Christ. And helps us to be worthy of our calling. You know, and if we meditate on God's word, we will be like the man in Psalm 1. We will be like a tree that is planted by the river. Planted by the river. We will be productive. Not productive by the world's standards, but by God's. We will bear fruit for the kingdom. Also, when we meditate on the word, it helps us apply the passage that we've been reading. It helps us apply that passage to our own lives. What must I do in the light of the words that I have just read? We meditate on the words that we've read. It helps us to, to, to understand these things. It will help us to apply the passage to our life. It will help us to ap apply the passage to our daily walk with Christ. If we meditate upon God's word. And let me tell you, that's something that is missing today. I think I've told this story before. But I'm getting to that age, so I repeat myself. So you'll forgive me if I have. But at college, we had one particular one-off seminar, one-off off lecture. And a godly man would come and he came and he told us about, because we had so many books to read. But he was telling us the, the secret of skim reading. And what we had to do to, to basically, you know, get a, an 800 uh, word or 800 page book and, and read it within an hour or half an hour. We could skim read. And I was sitting there thinking, I can't do that. If I have a book, I have to read it from the beginning to the end. I don't want to skim read it, you know. And I, 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 Lynn can skim read and she retains a lot, but I cannot do that. But I think that's what many Christians do today. They don't meditate on the words that they've read. They skim read their Bible. They keep going back to their favourite portions of Scripture. Maybe one of the Psalms. Let me tell you, if you do that, you cannot apply scripture properly to your life. If you keep coming back to the favourite bits, the bits that you're happy with, and just skim over them, you cannot apply scripture to your life. When we read the word, we need to read it to study it. And when we do that, we understand it. If we don't do that, then we can't apply it. And what's the point if we can't apply what we're reading to our lives today? You might as well pick up a Harry Potter book. So what happens if Joshua and the people do these things? If, if they are obedient to what God has said to do. If, 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 they, if 
they are strong and if they are courageous, if they do observe, if they fill their hearts and minds with God's word, if they meditate upon the word of God, what happens? Well, verse 8 and 9 tells us. The second part of verse 8. For then you will make your ways prosperous and when you will and then you will have good success verse 9 have i not commanded you be strong and courageous do not be frightened do not be dismayed for the lord your god is with you wherever you go first of all they will prosper and have good success they will succeed they will be successful in their quest god would give them victory god would go before them into the land and give them victory. Joshua would be a worthy leader. He would lead the people successfully. Because God has went before them. And because they were obedient to what God had commanded them to do. Sometimes, and we do this often and we can all do this. We base our thinking of success on what man thinks. Especially when it comes to the church. Especially when it comes to the church. Large numbers, big building, extensions needing to be built in that big building, large bank accounts, multiple pastors, multiple meetings and activities. If that happens, if we see that, then God must be doing a work there. They're successful. God must be in it. They're successful. God is blessing that work. And of course, God does that in some churches. Churches that are faithful, churches that are obedient. And we've seen that and we can still see that even today. And we thank the Lord that we can still see that today. When churches are obedient, God blesses them. But for the most part, he doesn't. He gives us what we need. And that's it. Much of what God sees as success will not be recognised by man as such. Or even by some in the church as such. But also we see if Joshua and the people obeyed God, he would be with them wherever they went. He wouldn't forsake them. God would be beside them. And they would accomplish their mission that they were sent out to do and that they had been promised. Just think about that for a moment. Verse 5. Look at verse 5. Just think about this for a moment. Look at verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Verse 9, towards the end. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Listen, if, we, if you, if we are obedient to God's word, he will be in the work that we do, wherever you are or whatever work you're doing for him. You can be satisfied knowing this promise. It is impossible for God to leave you if you're obedient to him. He gave this promise to Joshua, but not just to Joshua. He gave it to Jacob in Genesis. Behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Genesis chapter 28. He then gave it to the nations in Deuteronomy. The nation of Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Amen. He goes on. 1 Chronicles. Solomon. And David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed for the Lord God. Even my God is with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. These words were written to these men and to the nation, but they were also written for us today. And in Hebrews 13, it says this. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? God is not going to leave us. He will not forsake us. Does that not fill your heart with praise and worship this morning? Because it should do. 
is doing it to me right now, knowing that, that our Lord, our God, will not leave us. He will not forsake us. Whatever situation we find ourselves in this morning, whether it's a personal situation, whether it's something to do with family, whether it's something to do with temptation, whether it's something to do with sin, cry out to Christ, for Christ is there. He has not left you. Turn to him. He's there. So we've seen Joshua, a slave, a soldier, a servant, and a shepherd. I had to get my alliteration in there, didn't I? A slave, a soldier, a servant, and a shepherd. Chosen by God to lead the nation of Israel. And, and that's what he did. He led the nation. But also as he led the nation, he was to meditate upon the word of God and to do all that was written in the word of God. And if he did, if he did that, then he and the nation would prosper. That is a lesson for us today. God's word is still sufficient for us living today in the 21st century. Of course, times have changed. Of course they have since the times of Joshua. Society and culture have changed. The landscape has changed. We're in different, in different countries, different continents. But also the definition of sin has changed. Maybe I should rephrase that actually. In the world's eyes, the definition, definition of sin has changed. Not in God's eyes. You, you know that many of the situations and the, the experiences that we have today, the original authors of scripture would never have envisaged that we would have to put up with these in our daily life. And as I said, how sin and the definition of sin has changed. But you know, even in the midst of that, we should be crying along with the reformers of old. Scriptura, sola scriptura. Scripture alone. But maybe not just cry scripture alone, but also obey scripture alone. Even the bits that are hard to reconcile to today's culture. And let me tell you, and you know, there are many. But let me tell you something. And let me make it very clear to you this morning. If culture or social commentators or lawmakers of our land or lawmakers of any land don't match up with the teaching of Scripture, if they contradict the Word of God, then they are wrong, not the Word of God. They are wrong. And we must not be afraid to say so. Yes, we will probably get abuse if we do, but we must not be afraid to say so. We must stand firm on the word of God. We must stand firm on its inspiration. We must stand firm on its inerrancy, on its infallibility. We must stand firm on its authority. Listen, for every situation of life that we find ourselves in, every, everything that man needs to know about his creator, about godliness about sin about salvation are all contained within holy scriptures we must stand firm and not turn from them we mustn't turn from them from the right hand or to the left just as joshua was commanded you know god in his word tells joshua that if he has God's word in his heart, if he was obedient to it, then whatever situation he finds himself in, he would be equipped to do all that he's called to do. And God promises that he would go wherever Joshua went. Let me tell you, that's an incredible promise. Think about that just for a moment. That is, that's probably one of my favourite promises that's found in all of scripture. It's just, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I, the Lord your God, will go wherever you go. And this can be applied to us today. As I said, when Joshua was obedient to God's word, he was victorious. That applies to us today as well. 
when we are obedient to God's word, to all its commands, then we will live victorious Christian lives. Let us stand firm in God's word and the promises that are found in God's word. And if we do that, we will have victorious Christian lives. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, once more this morning, we thank you for your word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the promises that are found in your word. But just not for the promises, but for the fact that you are a promise-keeping God. And what you promised Joshua, what you promised the nation of Israel at that time, that you would not leave them, that you would not forsake them, that you would go wherever they went. Lord, we can apply that to us today. Heavenly Father, if we are obedient to your word, to obedient to its commands and its directions, and Heavenly Father, if we are obedient to the author of the word, then you will not leave us, that you will not forsake us. And we thank you for that this morning, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us this Sunday morning. And um, we do hope you'll be back this evening as we look at God's word again. And we're going back to the Sermon on the Mount. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 7 this morning. But stay with us for a couple of minutes. We're going to sing a praise and worship hymn, O Church Arise. And again, I think it's from uh, Grace Community uh, Church in Sun Valley in the US. So thank you again for joining with us and may the Lord be with you for the remainder of the day. Amen. Thank you.